Well, hello. I'm Dennis Dujic, president and founder of the International Association for the Advancement of Steam Power. Welcome to our first IASP virtual steam power educational conference. Today, following some carefully selected video presentations, we'll be hearing from Carl Peterson, a good friend and noted steam power pioneer. He's here to answer your questions about personal sized steam engines of the future. Well, what do you think of when you think of a steam engine? Perhaps your vision of a steam power is something from the distant past. Maybe a giant coal-fired power plant, a steam locomotive, a steam ship, or even a steam shovel. Here are a couple of classic fun videos that capture a bit of the very early history of steam engines as they powered the Industrial Revolution. Shovel Marion was her name. The two of them were the best darn pair, at least that was the claim. Mike and Marianne, it's told they dug the great canals, cut through the mountains, filled up the holes, they were the best of pals. Cause Marianne, the steam shovel, Mike Mulligan would say, what a hundred men could dig in a week, she could dig in a day. Mike Mulligan and Marianne, they dug the highway straight. Airport runways, land and fields, you never had to wait. When Mike and Mary Ann would dig, this they liked the best. How crowds of people standing round always were impressed. Cause Mary Ann, the steam shovel, Mike Mulligan would say, What a hundred men could dig in a week, she could dig in a day. But then one day, a tragedy, the diesel shovels came. Stronger, better, faster, too. Nothing was the same. Some steam shovels were sold for junk, others rusted through. But Mike would never leave his friend, he was always true. Cause Mary and the steam shovel, Mike Mulligan would say, What a hundred men could dig in a week, she could dig in a day. So then one day in the newspaper, Mike Mulligan saw that in the little town of Popperville, they're going to build a new town hall. He told the folks of Popperville, we'll dig that cellar in just one day. And if we're not none when the sun goes down, you won't have to pay. Cause Mary and the steam shovel, Mike Mulligan did say, what a hundred men couldn't dig in a week, we can dig in a day. So the sun came up, they started to dig, first corner neat and square. Second turn, the sun was hot, dust was in the air. The people came, stayed to watch, which made them faster still. They cut away the third corner, gave the crowd a thrill. When the sun was just about to set, the end was getting near. The dust was thick and the shovel ran, and the people started to cheer. Suddenly, all was still, the cellar was neat and square. But Mick and Mary Ann were stuck. They couldn't get out of there. Well, sometimes the best ideas come from someone who is small. A little boy said, hey, she could be the furnace for the new town hall. What do you think, Mike? Well, Mary Ann, the steam shovel, Mike Mulligan did say, a better furnace you'll never find, shall keep us warm all day. So that's exactly what they did in the town of Popperville. And if you ever go to sea, 
fight them down there still. Cause Mary and the steam showed me Mike Mulligan did say What a hundred men could dig in a week, she could dig in a day. Mary and the steam shovel, Mike Mulligan did say What a hundred men can dig in a week, she can dig in a day. Well, these visions of steam power have remained in our collective minds for generations. But not everyone sees steam power as something from the past. Some look at steam power as something driving our future. Since we had fun with steam from the past, here's an example of a wonderful imaginative application of a small steam engine with a very familiar modern theme. Okay, uh, on that note, we're going to take a few minutes to watch a bit about how these early steam engines worked by looking inside the workings of an old steam locomotive. Do keep in mind that we're looking at the past to learn and improve for the future. How do steam locomotives work? With the invention of the commercial steam engine, starting the Industrial Revolution, these icons of progress made travel and transportation by rail a viable option, cutting travel times and connecting communities. Here's a somewhat simplified steam locomotive. With many trains of this era, the boiler is clearly distinguishable. A steam locomotive needs water and fuel, usually coal, carrying them either on the locomotive itself or in a tender pulled behind. The fuel is used to run a fire inside the engine, burning inside what's called the firebox. The fire is managed by the fireman in the cab, who, along with the driver, is needed to run the steam locomotive. The firebox sucks air from underneath the train to keep the fire from starving. The solid fuel sits on top of grates, through which dead ash can fall down into the ash pan. The firebox allows heat and smoke to escape the chamber through the so-called fire tubes, running the length of the boiler. The boiler wraps around the firebox and fire tubes, thus heating the water inside to boiling point, creating steam. As more and more water evaporates, steam builds up inside the boiler, creating pressure. Inside the steam dome, the steam can find a way out of the boiler towards the cylinders. In case the pressure becomes too high and the boiler risks exploding, a safety valve pops to relieve pressure. The amount of steam exiting the boiler is controlled using the regulator valve. This is effectively the throttle of the steam locomotive. 
because as the steam runs down to the cylinders, we get to the part that actually drives the wheels. There are two sets of cylinders, one set on each side of the train. Steam engines on steam locomotives are so-called reciprocating piston engines. Each set has one cylinder with a piston, connected to the driving rod, which in turn is connected to the driving wheel, which can be connected to the other wheels. The other cylinder contains the slide valve, which allows fresh steam to enter and used steam to exhaust from the piston cylinder. This way, the piston is pushed once from both sides to complete one rotation, creating that reciprocating motion, which is then used to rotate the drive wheel. The steam, now done with its job, exits towards the smoke box, where it joins any smoke coming off the firebox to escape out the chimney. Do you want, for instance, a more in-depth look into trains? Let me know in the comments below. Subscribe and hit that bell to get notified when the new video drops. So steam power has done more than capture the imagination. It's done more than power the industrial revolution. Here's a quick look at what one team of steam power pioneers did to push the limits of steam power. A 103-year-old speed record was broken and surpassed on Edwards August 25th, not by an aircraft, but instead by a steam car. After enduring weeks of Mojave Desert heat and mechanical setbacks, the British Steam Car Challenge team broke the land speed record for a steam-powered car, achieving an average speed of 139.843 miles per hour on two runs over a measured mile. This surpassed the original 1906 record of 127 miles per hour. Uh, well, uh, this uh, event represents a culmination of over 10 years' work by uh, various teams of uh, engineers and uh, uh, volunteers, enthusiasts uh, from uh, all over the UK. Uh, and uh, it's uh, been a, a, a long, hard effort to uh, bring, uh, bring down this uh, record that's been you know, standing for over a century. But the team didn't stop with one record. While driver Charles Burnett III was behind the wheel on August 25th and set the new measured mile record, the next day on August 26th, driver Donald Wales set a new land speed record for a measured kilometer, achieving an average speed of 148.308 on two runs. We've obviously broken the, the world's land speed record for a steam car. Uh, it's taken 103 years to do that. Uh, and we're here on Edwards Air Force Base who have been really helpful. The guys here have been really, really good fun uh, and helped us all, all the way. The team chose to challenge the record at Edwards because of the many benefits the location of the base offers. We needed uh, six miles at least uh, to run the car due to the uh, nature of the FIA regulations that mean you have to turn the car around twice uh, within one hour. Uh, the late bed has to be within 1% gradient and this is perfectly flat. Uh, we Many of the late beds around the world are at different altitudes and have different seasons and this fitted us uh, perfectly. Uh, the infrastructure that is uh, around in terms of the uh, EMT and the fire services uh, enable us to uh, run safely. Uh, the altitude is relatively low which gives us more oxygen for the, the, the boilers uh, and from a logistics point of view its closeness to LA uh, means that we've been able to procure spare parts and uh, uh, been able to accommodate the team uh, successfully. Air Force Flight Test Center Commander Major General David Eichhorn feels the steam car challenge is a complement to Edward's mission. It is all about performance. Uh, get, getting the folks out here to, to do their speed runs is exactly what Edwards does every day, pushing the machine to, the, to its limits, using the natural resources that the country has seen fit to give us. The records are pending certification from the Federation Internationale de la Automobile. More information is available at www.steamcar2009.co.uk. Don Waldman, Edwards Air Force Base, California. So in the next three short videos, we get a glimpse of how steam power, modern steam power, can help save the planet, starting with a look at some of the hurdles 
that true steam power pioneers overcame to make their ideas a reality. And ending with another great instructional steam power video. Ted Pritchard has been Still mad about magic. steam ever since he was a boy, when he built his first steam engine with his father. A little bit wet at first, and then away we go. Convinced that steam still had a future, Ted went on to design and build a revolutionary new steam engine, which he put in a Ford Falcon. Operating controls of the Pritchard steam car are simple. A foot accelerator controls the flow of steam to the engine, and the lever, resembling a gear shift lever on the steering column, controls both forward and reverse movement. The new vehicle caught the eye of US motor manufacturers, who tested it extensively on the streets of Melbourne. The Pritchard steam car already meets and surpasses 1975 automotive emission standards established by the United States government. The car was even flown to the US, but unfortunately, the steam-powered Ford never took off. The motor companies promised to fix up the existing cars as the best bet, so that the engine seemed to drop back, we had to give it away. We just could not financially support the work any longer. That was an extremely disappointing time. Ted put his steam dream on hold for 30 years. When he returned to the drawing board, he had a new plan and a new partner. Hi. Oh, it's Deja. How are you going? Well, it's Mike McCann. Yeah, hello. How are you? <laughs> Mike McCann could see a future for Ted's engine. It's a power generator. It's going to be small enough that two people can pick it up and put it on a ute. It can run on almost anything that'll burn. So villages, communities that might not be too prosperous can provide themselves with basic services like lighting and refrigeration, burning straw or sawdust or peanut shells. With limited finance, Ted hand drew his dream steam engine right down to the last nut and bolt. He does the complete engineering specifications. Any competent engineering shop can take Ted's drawings and build from those drawings. Sadly, Ted passed away in 2007. But Mike was determined to see Ted's dream come true. And with some venture capital, he got to work on a prototype. These components here are all made as per Ted's drawings. Right. They were all fully dimensioned as per his drawing. Yeah. After 12 months of making and assembling all the bits and pieces, the Pritchard steam engine prototype is ready for action. We're running at uh, 1600 kPa. Uh, we've fired up the boiler about 30 minutes ago. This is in operating temperature now, and we're about to spin the wheel on the uh, Pritchard Power S5000 steam engine. So let's do it, Pete. Okay, whoa, we're making electricity. Ah! <laughs> electricity from wood. Give it some steam, Pete. I'm going to plug in this other lamp. That's two kilowatts. We've now got a small scale steam engine. All the basic principles are demonstrated. I would expect to see these machines in the field being used by people who don't have to pay for diesel to produce electricity in their villages, the Philippines, um, Southeast Asia, India. So, from his handmade toy engine, Ted's steam dream might have finally paid off and revived the form of energy we might just need in challenging times ahead. Well, it's time to learn a little bit about Carl Peterson. As a kid, Carl Peterson took everything apart. He worked in his shop, attempted to study the violin and learned to speak Italian. Carl's technical curiosity sent him to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. His first work was in product development of architectural hardware and avionics. At Lockheed, he worked in human factors, electrochemical development, and facilities engineering. His steam curiosity brought him to steam car people, and he started sp spending his spare time with Richard J. Smith who was at the cutting edge of making novel steam automotive systems. Carl spent seven years as a full-time independent developer and manufacturer, building steam systems and converting 
vehicles. When the catalytic converter made gas cars cleaner, the interest in steam waned. A career in Idaho in product development and family life filled the next 33 years. During all that time, Carl wrote, edited, and published five automotive and technical publications and contributed worldwide. With his wife, Robin, he restored houses and classic cars. They were involved in many civic organizations. His most recent professional STEAM involvement was with Cyclone Power Technologies as Vice President of Engineering, ending in 2014. He now researches and writes STEAM automotive history. Here's a look at a couple of Carl's pioneering efforts in STEAM power. So the STEAM Citroen is Carl's second developmental STEAM car. Begun in 1973, it has a four-cylinder, 16-valve uniflow engine. Today, with the exception of Jay Leno and a few steam enthusiasts, almost no one drives a steam car. Practically no one in this country drives a Citroen. Certainly no one drives a steam Citroen. But if there was any fear in plowing fresh ground, it was not in the heads of Mike Ormiston or Carl Peterson when they began the project of constructing this vehicle. Mike wanted a pollution-free car. He intended to tour the Southwest with his teenage daughters. He thought of something sturdy, like a Valiant, but then the sturdy slant six Valiant engine and powertrain would disappear. So Carl suggested a Citroen wagon, comfortable, roomy, under the hood, and mechanically familiar to Carl. Yep, lots of room. This big six-cylinder Mercury outboard conversion Carl built for the Autocast Land Speed Record car would have been too much for a little compact sedan, but it was just right for the Citroen. The 650 engine in a compact car would spin the wheels and the power was only limited by available steam. The Smith rotary valve used in Carl's first car had been superseded by the triple bash valve concept. In 1970, Carl built up one using only the Merck crank and rods. Dyno tests showed that triple bash valve heads with large valve perimeters and short lift gave better flow. Carl designed heads built up from half inch steel plate. Merck 650 crank, rods and pistons were the basis. The crankcase was designed from heat treated aluminum weldments, nitrided cast iron uniflow sleeves were installed. Carl finished the block at the Bartlett's shop with Phil's help and Dick Smith completed the head assemblies with the oven brazed steel plates. <clears throat> Condensing is always the critical element in steam engines. Carl's test showed the best airflow for cooling was just where Citroen had put it, inlet under the front and outlet below the firewall. Direct drive through three number 50 chains to the differential was chosen and the chain was designed. A dog clutch to run in neutral was very important for setting up the idling in traffic. Sprockets were offset one third of a tooth to minimize chain noise. Automatically variable belt transmissions had been used to drive cars in reverse to drive generators on ships, but never for steam system auxiliaries. It calculated out fine with nearly constant speed between 15 and 60 miles per hour in the bench test. The engine could idle and run all the auxiliaries then with the clutch engaged. Everything was balanced from parade crawl to top speed. The chassis was stripped of all the IC drive components, then a firewall notch added for the radiator. The parts for the high pressure hydraulics were returned and a battery tray added. The radiator and shroud were added, fans, 
powered by two roots type motors using steam exhaust flow. The engine package went in with the engine mounted on the chain case with the differential behind. The black crossbar suspended everything, including the inboard disc brakes between the side frames. To the left of the engine are the variable speed accessory drive pulley and belt. The accessory package went on top, including the feed pump, AC pump, alternator, high pressure hydraulic pump, and at the bottom, the water circulating pump. Hoses ran the water and hydraulic fluid around. The hood latch bar went across the front. In front of the tire, the fuel pump, control valves, and microfilter were mounted in the corner. The steam generator burner is at the top left and the bumper completed the assembly. Now we'll take things out so you can see a little more clearly what was hidden. So here we go backwards. Back now to see the black painted, painted hydraulic system. And then the bare chassis, the emergency brake caliper hangs down on the right. The water tank was made to run at 50 pounds per square inch and fit in the frame under the front seats where the original muffler had resided. Steam exhaust went through a feed water preheater and a spray condenser. Tank water was cooled in the radiator and sprayed on the exhaust system. Mike tried to write off the project as a business development. But when his accountant disagreed, everything stopped. 90% completed. Carl showed the car at a Boise steam car meet in 1979. Today, it's in Tom Kimmel's trove of modern steam car projects. It is fun to see what kind of a car people think it is. Imagine though, if this steam Citroen were built today with today's super high temperature materials and technology, it might have run on concentrated solar power. Wait, is that possible? To run a car hundreds of miles on a single charge of concentrated solar thermal power? The answer is yes. Concentrated solar thermal energy can be collected, stored, and power and can power a steam engine in an automobile. Concentrated solar vehicle. This is from Design News, September 7th, 1981. Daniel V. Edison, associate editor of Design News wrote, quote, on board thermal battery can be charged by parabolic reflector to provide boiler heat for steam driven experimental car. Widespread application of propulsion concept could result in sizable energy savings. The solar powered test car jumped to life, he said. I drove a short distance, eased to a stop, checked the steam pressure and thermal battery temperature gauges, shifted into reverse and returned. The car had moved smoothly with surprising power and solely by heat energy stored on board. An intriguing, intriguing contrivance, he said. A 1977 Vega wagon stripped of its engine, transmission, and drive shaft, and refitted with a, with a 1915 Stanley steam engine, a monotube flash boiler, and a 700 pound thermal battery. The experimental car effectively demonstrated the feasibility of using solar 
thermal energy for vehicular propulsion. So maybe a solar thermal vehicle can be even can produce even better efficiency than an electric car. Theoretically, it will. The electric car, for example, takes solar photovoltaic electric production, runs through the transmission line to the battery where it charges the battery, and then the battery is discharged to the traction motor, and then it gets to the wheels. In a concentrated solar vehicle, car, vehicle the concentrated solar energy is stored and then transferred to a Rankine cycle engine, a steam engine, and from there directly to the wheels. To be continued. Now we're gonna... Hello there, Carl. Let's see, we're gonna, mute, we're gonna unmute you so that you can say hello to us. Hello, good morning. Howdy. Well, sounds like you had an exciting adventure so far, and I'm sure the adventure continues. So uh, thank you for sharing those interesting and amazing uh, concepts and work that you've done in the past. Uh, but we have some questions here from our participants that I'll be turning over to you. So you could get a chance to kind of address uh, what, you know, what's out there. So here's a question from Heidi. How much would it cost to build your steam Citroen today? Uh, in today's dollars, the steam system and research and development uh, cost uh, $90,000. And the car body redesign and construction was also 90000 These aren't production costs. These are just one-off custom car costs. If you made the gas engine and transmission from scratch, though, today it would cost about a million dollars. So this is, this is less than a tenth of the cost of uh, designing and developing an uh, internal combustion power plant. Thank you. Uh, and could it run on green hydrogen produced by solar or wind energy? Sure. Any heat source uh, can be used. Uh, doesn't really matter. Steam uh, is a heat engine. So any heat you supply to it will make it run just fine. The thing is that uh, taking heat from the sun and pumping it right into the vehicle, uh, you're going to have very few transmission losses along the way, and you're going to get your best punch out of your uh, solar heat that you have available. Uh, and if you take that uh, same solar power and run systems to create hydrogen and then burn that and run the car on that, you have many transmission losses and you might get one fifth the energy out of it <clears throat> that you got from the sun. So it's much more efficient to, to run it directly on the and use the hydrogen for other uh, carbon-free uh, heat purposes. Great, thank you. So Thad asks, how could you overcome the challenge of adequate solar steam energy storage for a solar thermal steam-powered car? Well, uh, solar thermal systems and energy storage are currently uh, done. It's current technology and this Heat is stored in salts or bitumen or uh, pressurized hot water. And uh, for stationary applications, they can be stored in dirt or concrete. Uh, there are so many ways to do that. The key requirement for a vehicle, though, is quick interchange. So it's probably going to be a liquid, uh, hot liquid that this uh, liquid salt or liquid bitumen that it heats stored in so that you can quickly exchange it like you do filling a gas tank. Okay. Um, and another question is, what is keeping steam power from progressing and what can be done to overcome those hurdles? Well, uh, now no one who's listening to this has probably ever even heard of the concept of a solar powered 
vehicle. And uh, so having people learn about this and realize that it's an opportunity is the biggest hurdle. Okay. Uh, and Pamela asks, um, what are, what are we hoping that people will take away from, from this conference and that will contribute to steam power helping save the planet? Well, I, I hope they realize that uh, this technology, although all the pieces of it have been around for centuries, uh, it's uh, a newly, newly pack, uh, put together a combination of clean, efficient energy uh, and to keep the convenience of today's cars while eliminating carbon emissions. Terrific. So, Renee would like you to address how do you make modern steam power more fun to learn about? Well, uh, I always had a great deal of fun in school uh, with science fair projects. And I think this would be a great subject that would be quite unique for people to present in their science fairs. And it'll probably catch on for university demonstration programs like we had during the clean car era when they started trying out solar cars. For PV solar cars, that is. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, not seeing any other questions, I'm going to say thank you again, Carl. You're and welcome. thanks thanks very much to the uh, IASP board and staff, and especially to Aaron at Partners in Computing for making this event possible. If you all have more questions or just want to know more about modern steam power, check our website at steampower.com. You'll find lots of fun and educational stuff on our Kids Steam Power page as well as links to other experts in steam power, steam automobiles, steam boats, steam toys, and related information. And thank you for watching.